Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, the first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing reports, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm Butch Theory, and I'm joined back today with Captain Joe Baya. How we doing, Joe? Pretty good, buddy. How about you? Good, man. Good. Just trying to stay warm a little bit. It's windy. Yeah, it's uh, actually a beautiful day, though. At least it's not raining. It's. I never complain about cold weather, man. I love it. I yeah. love it. No, absolutely I, yeah, love it's it. Tough for me. Y'all had a good show last week, man. I enjoyed listening to you and Richard break it down. It was uh, some good nuggets of wisdom in there. It was, man. We had a good time uh, recording. It's always good to have Captain Richard rolling into his house. Had a good time. Some good reports. People are catching some fish. Uh, Bama Beach Bum was pretty bummed. Uh, but other than that, I think he'll go back. He, I think it sounds like he's on a sabbatical, so maybe when he comes back, he'll be rejuvenated. Rejuvenation is important. It's easy to get yeah. uh, easy to get a little burned from time to time when you're doing it day in and day out. So hopefully he gets out there in the woods and shoots something that'll make him feel better. Unagi. Unagi. Well, man, speaking of uh, sabbaticals and burned, what you what you do down there on the Mexican border? <laughs> well, uh, I got invited down there. Some birds? We did. I got invited down there by my buddy Hank Shaw. You know, he's been on the show here with us before. And uh, oh yeah. Yeah, we actually hunted some some what's called a Mern's quail and some Mexican mallards. There's a specific type of mallard, um, kind of like a Florida model duck, but it's uh, unique to the Pacific Flyway. So we were down there hunting them, and uh, I had an awesome time, man. I mean, we were right on the border. I mean, when I say right on the border, I mean I got a picture of me and a and a nice big fat mallard sitting on the on the border barricade. So it was a lot of fun. It's awesome. New country down in the Sonoran desert. Never been there before. Never been to Arizona period, but I had an absolute blast. That's awesome, man. I'm glad you got to get down there and do a little bit of something different, man. It's always fun to doing something different. Yes, it is. I, you know, that's one of the things I'm just really lucky, you know, and hashtag blessed to be able to, <laughs> to do a little traveling, you know, it's expanding your horizons. It brings all new, you know, different angles of things and, and things you don't think about on a regular basis. And, uh, we live in a great country, man, a really diverse country and, uh, a lot of opportunities for all of us here. Mm -hmm. Just get out there and get after them. And, uh, it's that way across the whole country. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. The pictures were beautiful. I enjoyed the pictures you sent me. Pretty birds, pretty scenery, man. Beautiful mountains. Yeah. Arizona, you know, their, their climate's a lot like us, except no humidity. So their winters are a lot like our winters. And, uh, yeah, we have beautiful weather, beautiful scenery, good fellowship and, uh, good bird hunting. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. The sunshine state. Love that place. (laughs) Well, the question is, is I know Hank was on vacation too, but did he cook anything awesome for you? Unfortunately not. No, we were down. we We were so remote. We didn't have any access to any kind of really any cooking or anything like that. So man, we hunted hard too. We hunted daylight till dark and, uh, we were pretty wiped out by the time we got back. So, uh, yeah, I didn't get any of the, Hank experiments or anything like that with uh, with the quail, but I sent my quail with him, and I'm actually going to be seeing him again pretty soon. Uh, so I kind of bartered a little bit, you know. I said, "You, you have my quail, but you gotta you gotta hold on to me because I expect a Hank Shaw quail dinner coming up." So that's fair enough. Yeah, I always All wrap right, man. I always wrap my tentacles around somehow. Yeah, that's what she said. All right, Butch, who's bringing us the show this week? This week's sponsor of the show is our local Geico insurance office. Everybody knows Geico has great auto rates, but did you know they also have great rates on boats, ATVs, motorcycles, and personal watercraft? Give Ron Davis a call at 251-445-0053. Not only will Ron work hard to get you the lowest premium possible, but you'll have the service you expect and can count on if you ever need to make a claim. Geico does even more than insure your valuable items. They also offer on-the-water services like towing, battery jumps, gas delivery, and you can save by bundling these services with your insurance. If you're an Alabama saltwater fisherman, support the local insurance agent who brings you the fishing report each week. Call Ron Davis, Geico agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash AL. Well, where are we going to head next, brother? Let's get the inshore report from the Marshall of the Mississippi Sound, Captain Bobby Abrascato. What you say, Captain Bobby? How's it been going this week? <laughs> cool. Well, cool the last couple of days, guys. I can tell you that. Uh, no you doubt. Know, uh, Cool and windy, but, you know, that's the way it's been, man. We've had these, uh, this is our third really sure enough good cold snap. And, um, you know, it's looking to me like long range forecast right now. We're going to at least stay cool, maybe not super cold, but cool. And, um, you know, I think some of uh, the only thing that's been consistent for me, at least in the last few weeks since we talked is, 
it's been inconsistent. <laughs> That's the only consistency to it, you know. Yeah. You know, you'll catch these days where we're literally bundled up in, in insulated coveralls and boots and beanies and jackets. And th- two days later, three days later, you're in shorts and a T-shirt, you know, sweating. So, you know, that's, that's a tricky time of the year. And it really kind of influences the way the fish react. And the other thing, too, is you get these events that we're having, having right now or just coming through where you get these big blows. And it really changes, dramatically changes the water levels. And that kind of a, the fish have to make adjustments to where they are. To me, it takes sometimes it takes a little while for them to get adjusted and get set up to their feeding patterns and that sort of thing. So, you know, again, getting back to the good news, I think, you know, now that we're going to have a little bit more stable, cold to cool weather for the next few weeks, I think it's going to get a lot more consistent. The fish are still there. They're still in the same places they're going to be for the next month or two. Uh, it's just you've got to figure out sometimes, you know, from sometimes from one day to the next, you know, what they're going to do and where they're going to be. You know, and again, it's still, you, at least you know you're in the right areas. You just got to have to make some adjustments. Bobby, you're talking about these hard north winds and that, that creates these extreme low tides. You can see it if you go across the bayway or if you're hanging around any of the estuaries, you can definitely see a lot more bank and a lot more bottom than you can normally see. What are the, what specifically do speckled trout do when this, when that happens? Are if, or is, if you're going to try to go out and fish when you've got these extreme lows, where do you key up? You got to get in the river channels because that's the only places that there's really going to be any amount of water. And even if there's water, like on some of the flats, for example, uh, in some of the warmer days we were catching the fish, those water levels get so low that the water column's cooling off too much for them to really be thinking about being active. And they're going to drop off into the the deep, you know, the the, the river channels, which is going to be the deepest water in the area that they're in. And uh, you have to do that, you know. And uh, so on days when we get these super low water events, uh, some people like them. I mean, there's people that will say, oh, they drop off into the holes and stuff. And they do to a certain extent, but they don't know that there's a 25 foot hole five miles away. You know, they're going to drop off to the deepest water they can get to, which may only be six or eight feet. And that's the water you're going to have to focus on and on these events. The other thing I find, though, is and it sounds so easy. I'll just go find the deep water. The other thing is, I think there's a period when you get these events like we're having now. We've had a couple times already this this winter. These fish just shut down. I mean, they're just really, really hard to catch when you get these these events like this. It takes kind of a couple of days for them to adjust to the water levels, to the water temperatures and that sort of thing, and to their new surroundings, you know, too. So, you know, the magic days seem to be about two days behind these fronts, which is going to be this Thursday here. And it's happened on both of the big bull fronts that we've had so far this winter. It's been magic two day, two or three days behind is when the real magic happens. Do you have you know, anything those fish to get attribute fine. to that? You know, I, I think it's just what I just said to where they're just... Just kind of they finally get adjusted to where they're at there's probably a period even though they're not eating a lot right now but they've gone a probably a couple to three three days sometimes without any feeding activity you know so there's some of that going on but i think it's more of just kind of they they finally get more acclimated to, to what's going on around in their environment and their their environment affects them a lot more than it does us because we you know us you know, we think it's cold outside, but our body temperatures pretty much stay the same. Theirs don't. Their body temperatures drop to their surroundings. So that's why they're cold. I mean, that's what cold, that's what's cold cold blooded is being all about. Is so they had you know that their whole body is adjusting to that too. So I think there's some of that going on, and they just kind of get more acclimated to it. That's what I think anyway, and that's why I think that's that starts happening. And then the other thing too, just from a from a fishing standpoint, is you get two days behind the fronts, you finally get the wind to lay down. You know, and and even you know even if the fish are biting. If it's blowing like Butch was just talking about, where it's blowing 30 or 40 knots, you can't get a bait to a fish properly to, to even make it look right. You know, where right. you start to get days that I call fishable days now to where the wind's not blowing 30 knots, you got a chance of getting the bait to them properly. So, Bobby, it seems reasonable that if you've been on some fish pre front and you get one of these big, big tides that sweeps all that water out. Is it reasonable to just kind of go to the closest, like you're saying, they don't know where the deepest is, but do you just want to go to the closest deep water where you've been on fish? That's the place to start for sure. And then you kind of, you can move around there. Like when I've said that, that what I I was going with that, and you obviously picked up on is they're not going to totally abandon that area. They're going to be in that area. You know, they're not going to swim 
10 miles down a river, up a river, whatever to go. Cause they don't know there's that deep water. They're going to get to the, to where they're comfortable, where they're, you know, they're comfortable and um, that's where they're going to be. And, and they'll find it. I mean, it's just like us. We know where to go when we need to get warm or we need to get something to eat. You know, we, we know how, we know what to do. And they're a lot better at it than we are, believe it or not. I think, you know, they know that they got to do two things. They got to eat and keep from being eaten. If that's all you got to do all the time, you get pretty dang good at it. So you're yeah, talking about so. those, uh, those river channels, you know, being where they pretty much have to be how do you go about fishing those channels because i mean when i think channel i think pretty deep is a popping cork and and that kind of setup still going to work are they going to range up and down in the water column or do you have to get down there no, and get deep you got to get now if you're going to fish these areas right here you've got to get it on down they're going to be down in that river channel they're going to be down deep lower third of the water column you know and, and if you're fishing you know, a five foot channel, you, a popping cork might work. But typically when you get into these situations right here, particularly these days, uh, you're going to have to do something like a jig, a lead headed grub, something along that line. It's going to have to be on or buried near the bottom because that's where they're going to be. And then if these days start like tomorrow, for example, which is going to be Thursday, you know, these fish I start to come up out of these channels and I'll find them more on the ledges. And in those cases, a grub will still work, but those are the kind of times when I want to go to a slick lure of uh, that type of lure, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's a spinning mirror lure, or a slow sinking mirror lure. I'm a slick nut now, obviously. I sold 100% on that product. And um, so that's what I'm throwing. But pre slick days, it was a mirror lure, you know, something along that line, something slow sinking working down the ed- ledges. And you'll find that to start to spread out a little bit more, you know, as we get more into the weekend. Now, Bobby, I know you're a self proclaimed horrible jig fisherman i don't necessarily believe that but (laughs) but, uh, we'll take you at your word but so with with regards to jig fishing especially when you're talking about working your way through that bottom third of the water column if you're working a decline you know or an incline however you want to look at it you're working a bank that's sloping down towards that towards that deepest portion of the river channel do you have a way you like to approach that i mean do you want to be in the shallow water and working your bait back into shallow water from deep to shallow or do you want to be in the deep water and kind of working your way down the bank i kind of like to pull it down the bank or down the channel itself you know because what's happening with the channel yeah i like to actually you know ideally i like to be in the channel pulling the bait the direction that the 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 water's flowing you know if it's flowing well say it's flowing out yeah you want the bait coming with yeah so pretty much with the current because what you're imitating with that or you're trying to imitate even there's not a lot of there's a shrimp and they're going to be swept up in the current trout are feeding going to be feeding facing into the current so i really like the bait you know even if it's coming off a ledge coming with the, the direction of the current if i can make that work with the wind and the tide and that sort of thing because that's how it's going to look most natural to them and the other thing is going to set up real well for them they're going to be feeding facing into that current and that's how they're going to be expecting that bait to be coming not that you can't catch them going the other way but it just sets it up real nice for them if you can bring it to them you know, right to them in, in little, their face so they don't have to move. A little more natural, you mean, kind of if you're throwing exactly, parallel to exactly. the bank? And that's what that's all about. That's all. That's, I mean, well, it may be parallel or it may be down the bank. It sure. just kind of depends on which way the, the, the current's moving the water. So that's the way I try to set it up when I'm doing my jig fishing. And, and I wrote, uh, there's an article in this month's um, Great Days Outdoors about that. And, you know, and one of the other things, too, is when you talk about jig fishing, I do a lot better telling people how to do it than I do actually do it myself because a lot of people can feel the bottom better than I can. I have to watch my line. I cast it out and I watch the line go slack before I start working the lure. But some people can actually feel the bottom. They talk about feeling the bottom. And, and mm-hmm. those are the guys that are really good with the jig, you know? So you really got to, the main thing is, and even I'm telling somebody what they say, what do I do? This, if you can feel it or you can watch the line, but you got to make sure you're staying in touch with the bottom. That's where you know, where, that's when you know where your lure is. All right, Bobby, I feel like we're getting into some good stuff here. So I want to break this down a little bit further. So we're fishing that channel. And I like what you said about you're trying to work that bait with the current. and You're trying to work that bait through the channel as opposed to parallel, you know, or in the channel as opposed to perpendicular to the channel. And that reminds me back to what David Thornton has mentioned on here several times about catching uh, flounder in the surf zone. You know, what he does is he gets out in the trough and casts parallel to the beach as opposed to casting perpendicular to the beach and it keeps his bait in the strike zone the whole time so in the next, strike zone exactly yeah and so my my question for you is now we know we're going to fish this channel we know we're going to work our bait with the current and you know into those fish's face essentially how do we approach 
So if we're in some deeper water, are those fish spooky? You know, like, do you, can you go right over the top of them with a, with a trolling motor or are you going to blow them out of there? So how do you approach that so that you don't spook the fish you're trying to catch? Well, that's a good question. And, and first of all, to answer your question, are they spooky? A little bit to a certain extent. You can go over those deeper water fish with a trolling motor. Uh, and you, you can actually, I, they don't, I don't think they necessarily leave, even when you go over them with a big motor. I mean, I've had instances in this where you actually, a guy, you know, he has to idle by you and we're catching fish. And the guy's got to get by you, for example, as much as he tries to be courteous and he idles by you with his big motor running and you're throwing them in the literally in this prop wash and still catching fish. I've had cases like that. Obviously, usually when somebody has to go by like that, I'll say, hey, I'll get a bottle of water. It's going to be a few minutes before they start back, but they do start back. So much less spooky than in the shallow water stuff like we do in the spring and the fall, much, much less spooky. So, and I think this is where you're going with the question is, so I'll do what exactly what I think you're getting at is I set the boat up. Even if I have to go over the fish to do it, I set the drift up up to where I can I can come back if I have to go across them and then come back with the current you know and the only way I can get get to where I want to get to is go right over I think I'm going to fish I do it at idle usually this time of year I'd love to do it on the trolling motor but you get wind and you get current and you, your poor trolling motor is just gonna be worn out if you try to do it on the trolling motor but they're not spooky in the sense that you can idle over them and come back you know and I may exaggerate how far I go up if it's a short drift you know, I may exaggerate how far I go up, you know, just to give them time to get settled back down. But no, right. they're not, not to the point that they, that like we talk about during the, during the spring and the fall when they're in real shallow water, they're not going to scatter nearly as bad. Okay. I promise this is the last question. So <laughs> when you're doing this drift now that you're talking about, if the current's moving pretty good, I mean, can you just essentially cast it out and let, let the current take you and take your bait and just keep it in contact with the bottom? Or do you still want to be, what's your cadence? is what I'm trying to say. Are you trying to be faster than the current? Are you, or do you change it up and see what works? Well, you know, again, it's, you know, the, the how fast you're working it is going to determine whether or not you're staying in touch with the bottom. So, yeah. the, so the answer is to stay in touch with the bottom. And there are places like in the Delta where we do this, they call it a do-nothing drift where they literally they're never, I mean, they stick the rods in the rod hole. You know, they set the current, you set, you set the drift up to where the current is so, your current is uh, actually pulling the baits along for you. They don't even work the baits or anything. So you can have that extreme, which to me is an extreme current situation where you're, you're literally, they call it the do nothing, you're doing nothing. You're just standing there watching the rod to the point to where you take a place like a foul river, for example, where there's very, very little detectable current, even on a, on a big tide, you have to work that bait. You know, so you're casting that out and you're saying, okay, I know the tide's falling here and it's falling this direction. So I'm going to try and work the bait, but again, working it slow enough that you're either watching your line or feeling the bottom, but whatever pace that you're going to fish it at, whatever, whatever uh, cadence you're going to fish it at, you've got to stay in touch with the bottom. So some places you don't have to do anything. It stays in touch with the bottom. Sometimes you got to put extra weight on, you know, some of that stuff I was talking about up in the Delta were to do that do nothing sometimes you have to go to a heavier jig head just to get it to stay in touch with the bottom but if you picture what's going on, on the other end if you start working it too fast you're never as soon as you start reeling that reel the friction of that line the angle that you're reeling it up is going to bring that lure up in the water column so you have to just kind of pay attention to to the rate that you're fishing the lure at is to how you how fast or how slow you're going to fish it to stay in touch with the bottom that's what you have to do you know, and it, it's going to depend on the current speed and that sort of thing, and the, maybe the size of the jig head that you're using, that sort of thing. But it's got, you know, whatever it takes to st keep it in touch with the bottom, that's how you're going to fish it. You know, I know the water temperatures are starting to drop some, but they've also been fluctuating quite a bit. Are you finding that those speckled trout are finding it harder to wake up? Are you still finding that, you know, that crack of dawn bite a little better or a little later in the day? Are you seeing any kind of variance there? Yes to all of the above. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you, I still started crack a day, you know, I'm still going to fish it because I firmly believe that that's the best time of the day. But, you know, I've had days, you know, from one day to the next fishing the pretty much exact same weather and, and exact same areas doing the same things and having banner days and turn around right around the next day and having those head scratching days that you, you guys know what I'm talking about, you know, to where you're going, what in the world just happened, you know? And I've had it happen in the same day. You know, we had a trip not too long ago, not too terribly long ago at all, to where 
we I, I thought it was going to be perfect conditions. It was the morning after the full moon. We had cloud cover, some wind. It was just everything came in. It wasn't a lot of boats on the water. And I'm going like, man, we're going to wreck these fish, you know. And I made the mistake of saying that. And I never do that. <laughs> I said, man, this is going to be good today. We literally did not have a fish at 10 o'clock in the morning. Not a, not a, I'm not talking about didn't have any keeper fish. We didn't have any fish. We didn't have caught a fish at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I thought it was going to be a perfect morning, you know. And then fishing the exact same stretch of water three hours later, whatever it was, we, we got on two or three every cast bites, sometimes for lasting 45 minutes. And even when we were in between those bites, as we drifted down the river, at, at a point, somebody on the boat was always catching a fish, fishing the exact same water, you know, three hours later, doing the pretty much the exact same, well, exact same lures, you know, so that's, that's what it's been like, you know, and, you know, it, a lot, still a lot more good days than slow days. And, you know, but but it's just been, and I think it's a function of the weather that we've been having, to where we're just, you yeah. know, we go really cold, and then it then it warms up, and it just spreads them out, and you know, uh, and part of it's tidal too. You can I could kind of match some of the times of the day up to when the water movement was, and these tidal rivers are a little bit more sensitive to water movement, uh, more so than some of the flats and stuff I fished during the spring and fall, and uh, though it's some of that, but that's not the whole puzzle there. There's a lot more pieces to that puzzle. And I can't figure out what the rest of the pieces are. If I ever do, I can really maximize my fishing time, you know? That's right. <laughs> so I think, you just I think, say, okay, let's just go out. Let's go out at 845 and we'll be done at 930, you know? That's right. <laughs> so yeah. it just don't work like that. I, I can't put my finger on it. But, you know, and it, it happens every year. I mean, it's like this, you know, especially when we get these years where you get, you know, the up and down, you know, air temperatures and that sort of thing. But the good news is, like we talked about when we began, you know, I think we're going to be through a much more consistent period, you know, now it looks like weather-wise through the, at least look what I've seen through the end of the year, you know, we'll cycle out of this nip. We flip out of the nip uh, over the weekend and that's, you know, have one or two days there where they get kind of nutty for a little while. But after that, it should be good all the way through the rest of the year. I just Man, put the whammy on us, I'm sure. But No, nah, yeah, don't jinx us again. Now, I think you really, uh, I think you really hit the nail on the head earlier talking about this time of year is it's kind of difficult because like we're talking about the 75 and the 32 the next day, those fish have to, you're talking about the, you know, the second day after the front coming through, those fish have to acclimate to what mother nature's throwing at them. Exactly. And it takes them a little while, you know, and, and so does. that's, you know, it's got, and it works both ways. It gets, when it gets super Certainly. cold, they yeah. have to change and, and say, and send the same way. And, you know, and all that's going on while we're trying to catch them, you know? So, uh, but that's that's why when it gets when you drop into sh- sure enough drop into the true, you know whatever period it might be whether it be winter or summer or whatever it is and they get set in that pattern that's when it makes it a little bit easier because just because they're more consistent. Yes, sir. Agreed. Well, you know we gotta get that tip from you this week, and this week's inshore tip is brought to us by CCA Alabama, a great way to support the conservative projects like the Claude Petit Flounder Hatchery and the University of South Alabama Tacobia Tagging Project is through the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama saltwater fishing license plate. Just head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's distinctive license plate page at revenue.alabama.gov to get yours. What you think for a tip this week, Captain Bobby? Well, we couldn't time it any better, man. Uh, probably by the uh, uh, will be uh, this will be my last report with you guys. I think before Christmas. By the way, I want to wish you guys and your families Merry Christmas, and um, and all of our uh, listeners too. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas! I hope everybody has great holidays and catches a bunch of fish if you go fishing. But I thought what we do is you know is I guess maybe a form of a tip is maybe you know because everybody's always uh, I get asked all the time, hey, what can I get my husband? What can I get somebody for a Christmas gift? I just, one of the things that I use religiously this time of year, you know, in addition, obviously, to rod and reels, is uh, I, I have everyone wear the little fanny pack life vest. Um, this time of year, you're always wearing, you know, coveralls and boots and, and everything else. And I don't care how good of a str- swimmer you are. If you go in the water this time of year with all those clothes on, you don't have long before yeah. you're going to start going down. You're going to be a brick. And, uh, <laughs> you're going to be a brick. You just can't swim with all that stuff on. And they make these things now that are so easy to wear. You don't even know they're on there and they just pop a little tab on it. You just pop it with your hand and it blows up like a basketball. And, and I've tried it in my swimming pool. Fortunately, I've never had to try it out on the water, but I tried it in my swimming pool and, and it'll hold you up. It'll definitely hold you up to where you can either get to the bank or get to the boat or somebody can get the boat back to you, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, that you can get them at, you know, any of the outdoor retailers and, or the, the online retailers. I, I get mine. I carry them on my boat. I carry about five or six on my boat and I give them to the charters and, uh, 
and and uh, you know we put them on, and most of the time I have to remind them when they're getting off the boat to take it off because they forget they're wearing it, you know. So that's how unobtrusive it is. And and I just you know, again you, you, we've all, we I fall in the water a bunch of times. Fortunately, never with a lot of clothes on, but you know you, we all can imagine what would happen. And so if you know, if you're looking for a gift, they're they're less than a hundred dollars. You know, if you're looking for a gift for somebody, you can pick one of those up and. Uh, I think it's a great, great gift for somebody. You can use them year round. I talk about using them during the winter. You know, it's probably not a bad idea to wear them all the time. But uh, you know, I just lay them in the boat, and as soon as they get on the boat, it's just like putting on a belt, and you're you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. especially if your husband's one of the type he had to go out on his own. I mean, that's safe. That's right. You know, if you think about it, talking about being on your own, and I think about this sometimes. I'm up on the trolling motor if I'm by myself. And you fall out of that boat, and, and like I was, we were just talking about, you know, fishing a place like the Delta, for example, where you got this extreme current. By the time you come up, you can't yeah, yeah. be able to get to your boat. Yeah. You can't get to it. That boat's gone, man. Especially if the trolling motor's on, you know. So mm-hmm, if you make yeah. wrong one wrong step, you know, we get ice on the deck of the boat sometimes this time of year, you know. But one little wrong step, or something happens, and you go over, you know, you got. You better hope you got something that'll help you float because you ain't staying up long. I can tell you that. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. Great tip. Always like a good safety tip. You can turn it into a gift idea. That, that's even better. Well, I like. Uh, yeah. I, I, I like that a lot. I also like the idea of we. You know, we talked about that Spot X thing that we tried that one time. That'd be something cool to keep on your boat as well. Yeah, it's small oh, enough too. Yep. It's about the yep. size of a like a BlackBerry or something yeah, like small that. Small pager. You know? I mean, it's yeah. tiny. And you could throw that in a in a jacket pocket. It happens every year. So, sad to say, but it happens every year. Somebody goes man overboard in the cold, and a lot yep. of times they don't come back. And uh, just yeah, you, it just happened. It just happened this week. Some guys, you know, luckily they were yep. they were close to the ramp. But I mean, you know, this time of year you go in, dude, you ain't you ain't lasting long. You know what right. I'm saying? So. Yep. Um, I mean, it's just a simple, inexpensive thing to, um, you know, to, to eliminate something really terrible like that happening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, 100 or 200 bucks for the Spot X and the Fanny Pack Life Jacket to sneeze. But, yep. Yep. That's what exactly we spend right. on everything else, you know. And Butch, you were a, life, <laughs> exactly. you were a, uh, you were a Fanny Pack most of the time anyway, so that doesn't even hey. cramp your style, you know. <laughs> hey, don't hate them Fanny Packs, brother. They are a great fashion <laughs> accessory, and they're super accessible. <laughs> well captain bobby we wish you a merry christmas too sir i hope you get like a a magic flounder bait in your stocking (laughs) (laughs) this guy with the flounder hate (laughs) hey man hey look you know what i'll tell you i i can't even help but laugh at it because if you know if it wasn't (laughs) true you know Oh, yeah, and that, the only thing I'm worse than that is that um, it's almost as bad as my jig fishing. So, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, man, Merry Christmas to you too, and we appreciate you having you on, and uh, have you, you and your family have a great holidays. All right, guys, thanks a lot. All right, man, that's a great report. Where are we going to head next? Let's head on down to the Gulf beaches, maybe on the pier. Where do you think the pier pounder's been this week? What you say, Captain David? Where you been? The pier? The uh, the surf? What you doing? Just trying to get the icicles, the popsicles knocked off, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're well, fishing today, yeah. there would definitely be some popsicles if you were fishing today. Another, yeah, another frigid kind of outbreak. Like, you know, we've been seeing about every week and a half or so, things will warm up a bit. I was down the other day fishing in shorts and short sleeve shirt, even took my sweatshirt off for a while and walking on the beach and, and even waded out to about waist deep water to make a long cast. And it wasn't that bad of a day at all. And uh, I, I cringe thinking about it on a day like this because it's so chilly, even midday, you know, with the sun out, it's uh, pretty chilly right now. Well, David, I, I missed last week's show uh, in person, but I got to listen and I, I'm a little bit worried about matthew isbell uh, uh, from what i understand he's gone to the woods for two weeks almost sounded like he was hanging it up like it's been pretty slow and then and then i see you make a comment this week said you you limited out on sunsets yeah <laughs> yeah the fish weren't tearing it up so i got some beautiful sunset pictures <laughs> right you know, well, that's, you know that's anytime what I always you say. see that that's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you weren't really trying that hard. You were just going out there to enjoy yourself, right? Oh, yeah. You know, when you get a gorgeous day in December in the 70s, you just have to enjoy it and just soak it in. And if you catch fish, that's the icing on the cake, you know. And actually, I I did bring a few whiting home and made up a batch of ceviche with that and, uh, you know, been enjoying that this week. But it, it wasn't a meat haul or anything like that. I, I caught in in the end, I had to I had to move several times, several different places, but ended up at the end of the day pretty consistent. I had to go back down to two just two rods because I couldn't 
keep the whiting, the small whiting off of them. Well, that's um, good you know, so hear. I had plenty of action. Yeah, you know. And uh, I fish a lot of light tackle under those kind of conditions and just try to, you know, in, enjoy the smaller fish. And, and if I do happen to get one of those rare big fish that crashes the party, that's just a fun ride for 15, 20 minutes, you know, that it takes to subdue that big fella. Let's talk about that light tackle setup a little bit, because that's that's one of the things that I want to get more into myself. Most of the surf fishing I do is just kind of like set rigs and the tackle is a little overkill for most of the fish that we catch, most of the fish I catch anyway. And um, this year I'm planning on scaling everything down and, and going to more light tackle. So do you do that purely for your enjoyment or do you feel like it helps you catch more fish? Oh, both. When I really got into pier fishing and tried to dissect it, I noted that when I stepped down in line size, my numbers of bites would typically go up. And it's for two reasons. One is the thinner line, you know, under clear, calm conditions, the fish can't see the line as well. And also maybe they don't feel it. You know, there's that factor that we don't necessarily think of. But also the lighter tackle, you know, it fits easier in your hand and you just have more control over it. It's not as fatiguing, especially in hot weather, but even in cold, you know, you don't want your hands to get cold and numb holding a big five or six thousand series reel and you can get by with a 2500 or a 3000 that you know weighs a fraction of the amount and uh the sensitivity of the bite you know in especially if you're dealing with the smaller pan size fish that are in the surf zone right now or from the pier when you're fishing for whiting or trying to detect that sheep's head bite you want to know when that shrimp is jumping away from me uh with that lighter tackle you know you can feel that bite better david we've talked on here before that you guys really like the steelhead rods and i if i remember correctly you choose about an eight or nine foot version it's a is a two-piece rod yeah most of those are but it, it's really not too bad of a drawback that the you know the you don't really notice because it's a medium action rod anyway you know it's a it's a fairly slow rod and it really allows it to have a lot of uh whippy kind of action when you're casting or you do have a fish and really the only drawback i'd seen with that like using steelhead rods was that the uh the guides didn't last real long in salt water you know i would just replace them with better fuji guides and you know when it came time to rewrap the guides and uh, it seemed to work just fine, yeah. No, 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 David. You got it all wrong. See, now you've just given me an excuse <laughs> to go about all new tackle. Yeah, well, I got to go down to the rod room. I think I need three one-piece, nine-foot rods. I'm going to go down there and choose my blanks and uh, go down there and talk to Miss Kathy and get myself some rods built. She's talking about all this. Yeah. I think when I got a sedan, I got rid of the van and got a sedan, and I, I had to go to two-piece rods then. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, you know, I, 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 the people that, that go fishing with me a lot of times, they're coming in from up north or whatever, and they're like, you know, they'll read my descriptions of the tackle and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, man, I, I just don't have room in my car for, you know, a nine foot rod or something like that. You know, everything I'm, I have is two piece, you know, and that's I think that works fine as long as uh, the reel and the line are matched to the action of the rod so that the rod doesn't have like a dead spot in it that's going to affect your ability to, to feel that bite when it comes along. David, I understand a couple of weeks ago, you were able to catch some really nice permit. Well, I was listening to Butch talking to Matthew last week, and it sounds like Pompano has been really hard to come by. What I really want to know about that permit, though, is were you able to eat it? I mean, I'm, I'm actually planning a trip, and I'm going to go <laughs> permit fishing later this year, and I'm wondering if it's worth it to keep one. Yeah, I, we were having a discussion on the surf fishing Facebook page about that, and I mentioned that I uh, had to uh you know that i that i kept several and my wife and i did a side-by-side -side taste test and we thought the the permit was just fine it was uh it was close to pompano but it it wasn't it wasn't uh as flavorful i guess as as the pompano is and when i i looked at the picture of them i could tell the difference that the uh the pompano is I guess because their diet is different from permit and, um, you know, in the genetics of it, 
but the uh, the permit, the meat was like a, it was firmer and it wasn't as oily, hmm. but it kind of lacked that nutty, buttery taste that pompano have. It was good, but it looked more like a typical jack, like the meat of a like a hardtail or you know, Blue Runner, You're not selling Jack, it here. something You're like that. You're not selling it here, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you yeah, know, I, not, and, you know, it. I figured, wow, why, you know, why don't, when the people catch those 15, 20 pound permit, you know, why don't they take them home and eat them? <laughs> and, yeah. and it's probably not the greatest eating fish, but I, I did come to the conclusion that, you know, if I were lucky enough to especially catch multiple permit again, I might keep one you know, to eat, but they're not as good as pompano. You know, I've heard they're delicious and they're, they are pretty good, but I don't think they're quite as good as pompano are. That's fair enough. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just one man's opinion and uh, I'm sure that other people might feel differently. And after Joe catches that big prize, I'm sure he's going to want to eat it and try it out. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be down in South Florida, so I don't know. They may draw and quarter me if I kill one of their big (laughs) tourists. (laughs) One of their when they're fed permits yeah yeah well (laughs) you talked a lot about the surf uh what's going on at the pier anything new at the pier yeah they've announced that the uh money had been approved and they are definitely closing the pier the 16th of january and it's going to be closed for several months while they redeck the pier and put new railing up and work on the bathrooms and do some other upgrades They've allocated about a couple of million dollars to do a lot of work. You know, that pier, the deck and all, and now is over 10 years old. And that treated pine is just not held up. And they're going to, they picked out a South American hardwood that they're going to replace the pier deck with. And they're hoping that they'll get, you know, it's a lot more expensive, but it's supposed to last like three or four times longer than just treated pine does. Well, I hope that they're not calling up a hurricane doing that. I know it. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will know where We've they been... go scavenge a bunch of ex- expensive hardwood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. The, you know, because this stuff, is, it looks like a lot like teak. And uh, it's, it's real hard and resilient. And it weathers real well. It doesn't splinter real bad like the uh, treated wood does. Well, So we're, okay. we're hoping it'll be there for a while. I hate it for the snowbirds because I guess they're going to be kind of out of luck when it comes to pier fishing. Uh, surf fishing's probably just, just got a lot more uh, c- competitive. Yeah, you know, especially February because they're so the the options are so limited now. Like even Cedar Point Pier is closed until March. People coming for spring break are you know kind of going to have to run out of options. There's probably going to be more pressure on the on the surf fishing side of things. Places like the uh, seawall at Perdido Pass, you know, the real popular venues are going to probably be overrun until the pier reopens because a lot of folks don't realize the draw that that pier has. And you know, the marine resources when they when they go out and do creel surveys and stuff like that, the pier is on one of their rotations. And it's treated just like any of the boat ramps or specific uh, public venues that they periodically rather uh, will go and see what kind of fish are coming in at that place. Mm-hmm. And they come to the pier. It's a pretty pretty quick rotation. They can they're they're there. Seems like once a month, uh, practically. Well, that's going to be a pain, but kind of no pain, no gain kind of deal. It's going to be awesome whenever it's done. I'm sure whenever it's all fancied up. So yeah, we're really hopeful that it's going to be for the best, and it, there's supposed to be some clauses that there would be incentive for them to get the work done faster and things like you know and and like you say maybe we just pray that there's no storms to delay them and maybe they'll get it done before april 1st for sure well you got the hey cap question this week mr david okay this week's hey cap question is brought to us by day cool heating and air as the saying goes if you don't like the weather in south alabama wait 10 minutes because it's going to change as we saw this week i was sweating my brains out a couple days ago and then the next morning i woke up and it was about 32 degrees but one thing that is very predictable is the pricing at day cool heating and air they offer flat rate pricing and don't charge for after call after hours calls let's face it your hvac always seems to act up when you need it the most don't get stuck between a rock and a hot or a cold place Daycool offers flat $45 service calls, $59 tune-ups, and they offer free estimates on equipment replacement. The pros at Daycool have been serving Mobile and Baldwin counties for over a decade. Contact them at 251-633-5121 
or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com or on the Daycool Heating and Air mobile app. They are license number AL07028. Butch, I, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to wait until my air conditioner breaks before I do anything about it, Yeah, which typically means a lot of hot. Mm-hmm. Seems like right now it would be a good time <laughs> to get some work done. If, you need, if you're thinking you may need some work done, at least get it checked out and make sure you're good to go when it That's starts right. heating back up. Agreed. So Absolutely. this <laughs> this week's uh, this week's slick lure giveaway is going to Brian Roberts. Oh, Brian! I All like right. Brian. He's been around since hey, we Brian. started this thing. So Brian says, this time of year, the air temperature fluctuates drastically, with water temperatures cooling as well. Are live baits such as small croakers, pinfish, and sand fleas not as productive? Brian also asks. I've noticed more people using fresh dead bait, such as mullet and shrimp in the surf zone. Are the fish feeding more on smell rather than sight? But hold on, David, there's still more. <laughs> should, I, should I stay away from the work of getting live bait and just stick to dead bait? Does it depend on water temperature? All right, David, break this thing down for us. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, I see several different aspects in that quick line of questioning. And it certainly does hit the nail on the head that this time of year, you know, the water temperature especially is almost as erratic as the air temperature is. And the South Alabama weather where you're sweating one day and freezing the next, you know, imagine what that does to the fish. It kind of throws them off kilter. It also makes that, those, you know, finding live bait fish and things like sand fleas a lot more difficult. But one thing these fronts do is like behind the front, the the hard north wind usually drops the water level as well as the temperature behind the front for a couple of mornings, especially if you have a low tide about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, that'll give you a couple of hours there during the morning to go out and slurp up some go shrimp. And then you're pretty much, you know, set up for the bait for the rest of the day, at least. If not, um, you know, I'm if I have any left, I'll I'll freeze some for the next time, put my shrimp in with them and freeze them up. And it, it does seem like maybe the fish get away from exerting a lot of energy, chasing live bait. I know that lures uh, a lot of times aren't as effective. You can still catch some bluefish and, and some speckled trout on lures, but it seems like the fish, their metabolism slows down. And the bait fish and sand fleas become a lot less prevalent than they than they are even in moderately warm conditions. So I, I try to go to like, you know, the fresh dead shrimp, stuff like that. And I'm switching over right now uh, with my fish bites. I'm getting away from the long lasting formula and going with the, the fast release that the water temperature is, you know, probably averaging a little below 65 and they they say that's the formula where it, the balance kind of tips mm. is that so what fish bite I, says i mean they, that's that's comes from the yes, company 60 65, yeah, 65 okay. degrees is what that's they cool to know. say and i i try to kind of stick with that and so i've been carrying both but i'm i'm starting to get to where the, the fast release you know has been getting more bites for me but it seems like the, the fish, their metabolism is really slowing down. I've noted that uh, a lot of the fish that I caught over the weekend were, you know, just small nibblers. There weren't any big bites and runs. I, I suspect their metabolism, you know, is starting to uh, be affected by this pretty cool water temperature. It may spike for a couple of days up above, you know, at or near 65, but then you know, the next cold front, it's going to drop back down into the 50s again, upper 50s, something like that. So it, it kind of keeps them off balance and it's pushed a lot of the bait fish into deeper waters, except for the pinfish, I guess. They've been really pesky sticking around the pier this year for some reason, but hopefully that'll be thinning out now too, you know, and they can get more of that. But even live shrimp, you know, are hard to get consistently this time of year. And there's been problems with the supply of fiddler crabs because they've been so popular this year. And so my, my fallback bait, especially with the early morning low tides and, and offshore wind, has been the ghost shrimp. That's what I typically use during cold weather. And it, it really does ramp up the, uh, you know, action that I get over just fresh dead shrimp or something 
to that effect that it it does seem to work better. Now, you know, as far as like for cut bait, if you're going after bull reds or big drum, you know, again, the fresher the bait you can get, the better. Some people pass up on the mullet that have been dead for a day or two that they get at the bait shop or especially the frozen and they'll if they catch some small croakers or small whiting they may cut them up you know and use them you know chunks of those instead of the day old mullet so you know fresher does seem to be better and one thing about cooler water is that it does seem to not only affect the fish's metabolism but also their sense of smell and i've, I've read some stuff about that the smells may not be, the odors may not disseminate as well in cooler water, colder water, than they do warm water. Makes sense. So it, it, and it, may, it may slow down their ability to detect baits, especially when the water's real dingy and stuff like that. So those are things that I try to kind of take into effect when, I mean, take into account when I'm, I'm out, you know, feeling the effects of the day and, and trying to make it work. Sounds like Brian Roberts needs to uh, check out your article you wrote on Great Days Outdoors on how to build a ghost shrimp pump. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure he's got one. <laughs> well, you know, if, if anybody's looking for that, all you got to do is, is Google how to build a ghost shrimp pump. It'll take you right there to Great Days Outdoors. But even better than that, we'll email you the specific instructions and you get to see a picture of David in his water shoes. So yeah, that's my favorite. That's a great <laughs> picture right there, by the way. Super exciting. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, my wife took that. I'm, <laughs> uh, she's got it framed in in the uh, in in the closet. Talk dirty, <laughs> talk dirty to me, David. All right. Well, David, it's been good, brother. Uh, always appreciate the report, whether it's good or bad. It sounds like there are some bright spots out there. We appreciate you letting us in Definitely. on uh, on what's been successful for you. I sure hope you have a good Christmas, man. We sure appreciate having you on here and you sharing uh, your vast knowledge of the pier and the shore with us. We'll look forward to having you on again. Absolutely. My pleasure as always. Yeah, guys. And, and same to y'all. I hope you have a, just a, a blessed holiday and that 2020 is even fish more fish filled than this past year. Got to be. Got to be. Thanks, Mr. Dave. We'll talk to you soon. All righty, guys. Well, Butch, that was actually four questions from Brian Roberts. And Brian, you're in luck. We're going to be sending you one slick lure for every question you send us, plus one more for good measure. So just send <laughs> us your address at alabama at bestfishingreport.com, and we'll get some slick lures in the mail to you. Really cool. It's a good dude uh, right there. Yeah, I uh, like old Brian, and, uh, and I like Joey Landrino. appreciate Joey hooking Absolutely. everybody up with uh with some slick lures and now's the time of year for them man they are they are definitely on fire for those big winter trout you said joey sent you a, a pretty cool video what would you say it was 28 inch trout he caught uh man i have to look back at the text message in the video but it was a giant hopefully yeah. we can get it released on social media soon yeah cool stuff cool stuff all right butch where are we heading next man let's head on down to the coastal connection see what angelo de payola is up to what you say angelo Man, just uh, trying to stay warm. It's cold again. Tis the season indeed. I did not think that uh, when we were having these cold fronts coming through and, and uh, freezing temperatures that we would even need to have a blue water report. But this year has been a wild year. What's been happening with you? Man, I tell you, I'm, I think I said this last time. I, I've never seen it this good this long this late in the year. I mean, it's just been so good so consistently fishy out in front of us and uh if you were able to get off last thursday through saturday morning and go fishing you probably caught fish but at least everybody i talked to that went out and did that did uh did they give you an idea of of, of where they were i mean was it still a floater bite or the, any of those fish coming it's down still and, and... floater bite and uh i don't think it even matters what you put out behind the boat right now i talked to guys that were trolling that were catching two to four blue marlin plus another half a dozen 130 to 150 50 pound yellow fins, one boat had 180 pound uh, big eye. Uh, the guys that were live baiting were, are still catching two to four blue marlin a trip at least. And the tuna seemed to be pretty thick. I actually talked to a guy that caught two big fish on the chunk at night. And you know, Appomattox continues to have a bunch of fish on it. Like the water, if you go back and look at over uh, Hilton's for probably the past two months, You'll see it's just sitting in, in a nice little park pocket of warm water. 
the Kika had a lot of fish on it last week. Pretty much, if you fish kind of the rigs in between those two rigs, you're going to catch fish. The Marlin kind of got a little bit cooler water. That didn't have, a, I didn't hear anybody catching anything there. But what I found interesting was that if you talk to guys that were fishing the nipple and elbow area, you, you know, late into uh, November, they were catching a ton of big, big black fin, 20, 30 pounders. And so I was talking to a friend of mine that was grouper fishing some of that stuff over near the cat's paw and all that. And they said, man, you would not believe how many big black fin we caught jigging for groupers like 10, 20 feet off the bottom. So that's a little different than what we normally get. Yeah, that's crazy. Usually what we see once we start getting a handful of these cold fronts is that the fish push off. But you never heard anything about the shrimp boat bite over in, out of like Louisiana Grand Isle area this year. At least I did. I just think there's so much bait on the rigs. Those fish never when they arrived this year, they never left and went anywhere else. That makes hmm. a lot of sense. And, and uh, you know, Tom Hilton has said that uh, many times. They kind of create their own ecosystem, so to speak, and and are kind of unfazed by altimetry and chlorophyll and some of the things that they look for. Not that those things can't improve the conditions, but when you got good bait and fish are holding to it, it's all that stuff's kind of out the door. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it just... I think I actually saw Tom put something out here recently about how good the water has been uh, ever. So basically off of Alabama, Mississippi, hmm. Louisiana th this fall. Well, so, I mean, it's nothing new. The fish is just still really good. Well, we deserve it because it's been a tough summer, two summers in a row. And um, so I'll take, take what we can get. Uh, and I know it's, it's just again, like we've talked about, it's one of those things that you've got to be sitting gotta be on, on go. go. Yeah, yeah it's not, and, not uh, the ideal time of year to be running offshore, really. Yeah, but if you can make it, you can make it. And I've seen a, quite a few. Looks like the Wahoo are starting to show up. Um, There's some good reports out of Venice Marina. Those guys over fishing out of Louisiana. Uh, looks like the Wahoo are starting to stack up. And Angela, when you when you've done that in the in the winter time, what time of year are you having the most success with Wahoo? Kind of looking forward a little bit. That's one of the things I like to do is think about if you wanted to make a trip to Venice and get in on that. I mean, just pretty much an epic Wahoo bite it can be. What time of year would you look for that? I think, to me, just going off my past experiences, later part of January, early February, to me, is the peak of that. They start catching them this time of year and in January, but probably second week of January to about the second week of March is kind of peak, you know. February, I think it's just the best time of year. It's going to be interesting to me what's how that's going to play out this year because we're just now getting the cold fronts that we normally get a little earlier in the year. And uh, I can tell you, I've never seen so many mullet in the marina as I've seen this year. The other day, that was like right before that front pushed push through. That was probably two, three thousand mullet in the little basin there. What was interesting was I would have liked to have seen what that looked like on a bottom machine because you could look in the water and there was like from the top of the water column to the bottom it was filled with spots. I just think all that stuff is going to get pushed offshore in one big giant push this year and I think it's going to make the wahoo bite phenomenal. And that's why it stacks up over there. All that bait the mullet and Ben Hayden getting pushed out of the river and into the Gulf this year, this time of year. That's what brings the fish in. Interesting. So, yeah. I know. I never knew that. I think it's that's going to be a good year. Uh, well, it makes a lot of sense. Hopefully it will be. I, I know it's, uh, like I've said before, that's one of my nemesis fish. And I don't know, one day I'm going to figure them out, but I haven't got them yet. But uh, it's really oh, yeah. good. If you can find a window to go, sounds like you need to go, right, Angelo? I mean, uh, it's you just know what? Those, Yeah. You Either know, go on your own boat or book it. Book a boat out of, you know, either out of Orange Beach or, or Louisiana. I, I think right now it doesn't really matter where you're going to go, where, where you're going, going from. Just get out there. You know, the nice thing about the Orange Beach trips is that you can make that a two-day trip, or you can do the Louisiana trip and come back in every night. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and if the weather's bad, matter. the worst thing can happen is just roll your deposit in the next year. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. You have nothing to lose. Yeah. Yeah, you got family coming in town. Go get yep. some fish, have a cookout. That's right. 
Absolutely. All right, Angelo, we got to get the offshore tip from you. This week is brought to us by Fish Bites. Are you guys tired of stinking baits? I'll tell you, that's one thing I can't stand is just, it's like I'm using an artificial bait and then I got to deal with stink. It's like, I feel like I've been gypped. You know, I don't want to deal with that unless I'm dealing with real fish. And that's one of the cool things about Fish Bites is that they don't stink, even though they are have an attractant and fish definitely can quote unquote smell them. They don't leave a stink on your hands. They don't smell when you take them out of the package and they just don't get on anything. You can put them in your pants pocket and it's not going to matter. They don't uh, taste that bad either, man. A couple of times I've been down there without pliers or a knife. I just bite them in half. It ain't there you go. Stuff. Yeah. A little salty, but other than that, you know, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, you know, you don't have to keep them on ice. Um, and the other good thing about them is they, they can really withstand bait stealers. That's what I like the most about fish Definitely. bites is when I put those baits out in the surf, I know I've still got bait. Whenever I cast out a sand flea or a ghost a shrimp, dead shrimp. Yeah. I feel like I need to reel it in every you know couple of minutes just because I'm not sure if the bait stealers got it. And that's one of the things you don't have to worry about. We talk a lot about keeping a bait in the strike zone. Confidence. And that's, that's what I've got when I've got that on the line is I'm not worried about – you know, do I have bait? I know I've got a bait in the strike zone, which is a really big deal. So, guys, y'all get out there. Check out the full line of scented saltwater. And they've also got freshwater baits for you guys that like to do freshwater. They've got some really cool stuff on the freshwater side that is going to be replacing the uh, Uncle Josh pork frog. It's already replacing it. So, if, you, if you're used to doing, like, jig and pig fishing, for the guys that are doing um, a lot of jig fishing in the spring, they've got a really cool jig trailer called Bob's Your Uncle. You can fish those under frogs, popping frogs, and all that kind of stuff. They've got freshwater baits, saltwater baits, and tackle at fishbites.com. Y'all check it out. All right, Angelo, what you thinking for an offshore tip, buddy? Man, where Christmas is right around the corner, and, like, for me personally, there's stuff that you that I always want to buy, but I can't bring myself to spending my own personal money on myself. So the best gifts I've ever gotten was stuff that, like, I wouldn't have ever bought for myself. But once I get them, I'm like, man, how did I ever live without this? And one of those things were a very good set of pliers. A few years ago, my wife got me a pair of band stall pliers. Hands down, the best pliers I've ever had. Probably the best fishing product period like as far as like use and enjoyment i get out of them they're just they're really nice pliers the cutting mechanism i've never switched it out it still cuts through braid you, you know regular pliers like after one trip they quit cutting through that stuff so you have to have a knife or a pair of scissors the other thing is they always spring back open and the ease of use and you know you don't really have to take great care of them they're just built like a german tank get them online or i got mine i'm assuming my wife bought them from jane and tackle that's i'm not uh, really sure what those prices are but i know they're not not super cheap um you think it's you think there's no doubt it's worth it there, there's no doubt it is worth it if your wife or your special somebody doesn't get them for you for christmas just go buy them yourself <laughs> i promise you it'll be the best money you've invested in your fishing kind of repertoire stuff you want to buy yeah it's well, funny you say that about the, you can't, you know, it's hard to spend money on yourself, but man, there's just some things that are just worth it. My wife got me an awesome pair of binoculars a couple of years ago and I couldn't even fathom that amount of money, but man, it's a game changer. It puts you, you know, on a whole different playing field in my opinion. You see why they cost so much once That's you right. get them. You're like, all right, I see why people pay this much for these. Yeah. And uh, I just feel very strongly about that. I don't have any financial affiliation with them it's just a really good product it's funny how when you you know you have something and we're all guilty of it but it's something that you use every single time it's like something you use daily like i'm kind of weird in that i've got i really like merino wool socks did, did okay? you just say you're, you're kind of weird kind of a little like half weird oh okay just a little bit yeah sort of <laughs> weird but like you know, I, like I got a pair of socks that's 25, 30 bucks and people be like, how do you know, you spend that much money on socks. But the thing is, you wear them every single day. Like, why? Yep. that's the stuff you should spend more money on is the stuff that you use every single day. And when you're on a boat, how many times do you use a pair of pliers? Yeah. Uh, the only negative I could say about that is I do have a tendency to drop pliers overboard. So do they have a good lanyard, Angelo? Great lanyard. 
really nice leathering leather kind of like sheath uh, or holster form. I mean, it's a you're gonna pay top dollar for them. They stand behind their product and uh, they're nice. That's awesome. and functionally. I'm with you. Yeah, I can't say anything bad about the product. It's great. That's great. We've always enjoyed having you on with us. Uh, this will probably be the last time we'll have you on before we hit 2020. Do you have Next any? Next decade, man. Next yeah. decade. That's crazy. Yeah. Do you have any uh, any new listings going into the new year? We've got some stuff that we will. Why don't we talk about it in 2020? We've got All right. Really nice listings coming up in the new year. Mm. Uh, give us something nice to talk about. I think right now, if you're a potential home buyer, that interest rates are really low and you know we're at a good point to buy i just think that we're going to continue to see increases in, in uh, property values as we go forward at least in my slice of the world there's just a lack of inventory and uh interest rates really low so if you're in the market go with uh, your favorite mortgage broker see what you can afford and then call somebody like me and uh we'll get the process rolling for you well, have yourself a good Christmas, sir. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll be talking to you again soon. Good deal, good deal. You guys have a Merry Christmas. Thanks, Angelo. Keep whacking them. All right, later. All right, Butch. I always want to find out what you learned today. So before we get there, this week's What Did You Learn is brought to us by Killer Doc. Butch, you said, uh, I guess the guys over at Killer Doc are like sold out right now, aren't they? Christmas time, man. <laughs> People really got in their Christmas orders for their husbands or their even wives. I mean, you have got a lot of... A lot of female listeners that love to fish. And yeah, I think they're uh, pretty much sold out of the 2019 inventory. I mean, you know, everything's built to custom for them, but so you can always get one built whenever you want. But yeah, they're uh, Christmas presents, man. Yeah. That'd be tough to fit under the Christmas tree, I would think. That'd be a little bit big. I could deal with it. Somebody bought me a killer dog. I'd be okay, <laughs> with, okay with that. You can put the Christmas tree on it. But yeah, yeah, I talked to Jay a few minutes ago and, uh, they're they're out of 2019 inventory and they're getting geared up starting to make some production for 2020 they got the miami boat show i think it's february early february of 2020 and jay said that um they just sold one in delaware which is awesome that is awesome but it you know it's just goes to show you like if you're thinking about getting one of these for next fishing season i'd go ahead and get with touch with those guys because Absolutely. They're, they're ramping up production and they're, and words getting out so make sure if you guys are thinking about one for 2020 as man mm-hmm start ramping back up into fishing season you better uh better talk to those guys and if you want to check them out online they've got all their different options there i was just looking at their website today they got a nice real clean website at killerdoc.com they've got all the different family of killer doc uh fish cleaning stations over there so y'all go give them a a a look and and if you're thinking about a a last minute gift you can always do a gift card yeah so i'm gonna get one from my hunting camp man uh skipper and i were butchering some deer this weekend on the you know our old worn out butchering table in the skin and shed i'm gonna get one for up there man why would you not it's super clean it's super sanitary it's easy to drain you can make it drain wherever you want i mean i'll just poke a hole at the back of the skin and shed and get it to run out that way like it's running off your dock you know right and i mean the size deer i've seen you shoot you probably put three or four of them up there and just knock them out yeah on the stretch maybe like the eight foot table for those 250 pounders all right man well what'd you learn I just thought it was really cool. A lot of things that Captain Bobby said about keeping your, in which we've always talked about, not always, but a lot, keeping your bait in the strike zone, how working that grub with the current or against the current or whatever, whatever the case may be, making it look like a shrimp imitation. I thought that was really cool. You know, I think what stuck out to me was that Bobby and David both basically saying the same thing. And it kind of ties in too with what Angelo was saying is that the weather is very inconsistent right now. You know, we're having to play this game of pre-front, post-front fishing. And because of these wild temperature swings, like what Brian Roberts was talking about, Mm -hmm. we are seeing a very inconsistent pattern, very inconsistent bite. And what I really learned from that is, you know, David talked about to put together his ceviche, you know, his uh, whiting ceviche, he really had to move around and stay with it and to, to get what he need, wanted to get. And, you know, Bobby, what stuck out to me, what he said is he was talking about that day on the river where he hadn't had a fish by 10 o'clock. And I don't know about you, Mr. Theory, but yeah. if I ain't caught a fish by 10 o'clock, I'm already drinking coffee back at the house. 
if I ain't got a rub by 10 a.m., I'm going to be warm somewhere for sure. Yeah, because, I mean, you generally, you think, like we've You're talked like, well, about, you know, yeah, first, first light. Today, yeah, if, I, if I've gone four hours without catching a fish, like, I'm giving yeah. up. But, but, but then Bobby, Bobby repeated, same drift, same, you know, same same stretch of water, same bait, and he smashed them four hours, yeah. five hours later. Well, he just, he fished in there, and he knew those fish had to be in there. The fish aren't going anywhere. They got to be right there. Yeah, they're you know, in those, You know they're in there. Right, so staying at it. You know, those guys, They when you fish for a living, you got to stay at it. You don't have a choice. Yeah. We all, the wreck guys, all have a choice, and uh, I'm a little too... I'm a little too fair weather when it comes to comes to that but uh, uh, when it's inconsistent like this you just got to stay with it yeah that's a fact all right man take us out of here all right guys that's gonna wrap it up this week you guys subscribe rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts if you'd like us to email you the podcast each week just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com forward slash asfr and we'll send you the show each week you guys keep whacking and we'll talk to you soon this week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator, bringing you the highest quality online satellite fishing chart since 2004. Your source for sea tips, altimetry, currents, and water color at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also, Killer Dock. Are you suffering from dock dysfunction? Check out a full line of dock enhancement at killerdock.com. That's killerdock.com. Also brought to you by Foster Contracting, Fortified Roofing Pros. Did you know you can save up to 40% on your homeowner's insurance with a fortified roof? Learn more at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-973-9999. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo DiPaola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo DiPaola Realtor, the coastal connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. And also, A-Team Fishing Adventures. Check them out online at www.ateamfishing.com or contact them at 251-661-7696.